Um, my name is Marcel Holtmann. I work for Intel, and the talk will be uh, uh, about what I've done as a small hobby uh, project one, uh, sometime last year, uh, see how much we can actually shrink Linux and run it on small devices that have actually limited RAM and limited size of flash, and what you can do to rethink this one. Um, so, a little bit of background, and you might realize that then why I've picked some of the choices that I've made when trying to this one. I've been working on Bluetooth since 2000. It's an awful long of time, and that technology keeps evolving and moving into the IT space, so it's becoming more and more important uh, when you have power constraint and small devices. Uh, I maintain the uh, Bluetooth Linux stack since 2004, so that has been over 10 years by now. Um, while joining Intel in 2007, for OTC, the Open Source Technology Center, I've created Conman, a connection manager, a phone, a complete cellular stack. Uh, Packrun, it's maybe not known much, but it works in the background for you to figure out your proxy support. Everybody running in an enterprise environment appreciates that your proxies get figured out automatically. A um, couple of years back, we've started uh, uh, Open Sourcing L, which is something like a glib library for small embedded systems. L stands for Embedded Linux Library. Um, and I also will give a quick um, intro, a short, really short one, into IWD on your wireless daemon. Um, the talk will be given next week at Open IoT Summit, so you can see it there, and uh, we will be opening source in there as well. Um, as I said, I've been working on Bluetooth way too long. I sit on the architecture review board as Intel's counselor. I chair the internet working group, so some of the examples are picked because we're working a lot of getting uh, IP and IP ready into the uh, IoT space. And while I can't really talk about this, but the Bluetooth SIG announced this, there will be Bluetooth mesh technology coming next year uh, as one of the big things where point-to-point uh, -point technology uh, changes its focus into a mesh-like technology and where that becomes more important than you can deal with small devices. The focus of today is really getting, why not switching to an Atos while stick with Linux, how far we can drive it. And I'm going to start this off with a quote that Jonathan Corbett did in... Uh, uh, at the Kernel Summit in Seoul last year. And pretty much the fear that he laid down was, if we can't shrink Linux far enough, then we're missing out on the IoT opportunity because at that point Linux doesn't become relevant anymore and everybody has their own thing and something else will gonna replace it. So um, after he gave that uh, quote, I thought, okay, look, what can we actually do to shrink it? Where are our limits? Where does it make sense uh, and where it doesn't? Um, and so, how far can we actually get? I know a lot of people don't really care. They run their big data center machines, their big iron machines, and God knows what. Um, and they have RAM, um, pretty unlimited RAM. We're talking about gigabytes and so on. But in some cases, we're talking about megabytes and below. And we still want to run Linux. It used to be when you had a 2.0 kernel, if people still remember that one, that was pretty easy to run on a small system. You were easy to put on a floppy disk if you still remember these ones. Um, now the question is how far we can actually get. And while this is not a scientific scale, um, I ended up with something, if you're larger than 512 megabyte of your flash or RAM consumption, and you're even considering doing anything else than Linux, then you're just wasting your time. I mean, you can find an Artos that will support you there, but the reality is you can just easily install Linux and you don't even have to do much work. You don't have to tweak much. You will find an off-the-shelf, fully packaged Linux distribution and you can just use it, put it on there, get on with your life and focus on your, what you really want to do. Write your application or get your use case done or anything else. So if you're above that one, forget about this. Less than a megabyte, uh, less than a gigabyte, really dead simple. Um, 32 megabyte to 512 megabyte, it becomes a little bit trickier, but it's still also easy. Um, and the reason why that number is on there, um, if you don't get a dedicated SOC, the smallest RAM chip you might gonna get uh, will be actually probably already in the uh, uh, 32 megabyte size, if you're unlucky. So, A to 32 megabyte, in some cases it becomes a little tricky. You have to do a little bit of extra work to get your Linux distribution that small so it actually runs. But same thing here applies. You might actually not even have the choice between choosing eight or 32 megabyte of RAM because the smallest RAM chip you're gonna get is uh, 32 megabyte already. Um, on the lower end spectrum, if you go less than a megabyte, Linux is really, really tricky. Uh, you have to do a lot of tricks, you have to do a lot of dedicated work. You really have to want to use Linux to actually get this going, and picking an Atos might be actually an easier way to uh, go there. Um, 
And then you have the rumbling zone in between. There's really a couple of ranges where it can go one way or the other. Um, if you wanted to megabyte, who knows? Maybe Linux, uh, you shrink it down and it will work for you, or maybe you're just going to stick with an Atos. 2.2 to 4 megabyte, Linux becomes a lot easier feasible. Uh, 4 to 8, you pretty much have a choice on what to choose there. But that's a rumbling zone, and the Atos has come from one side, they're going to grow, and that's the most choices you have to face with when you actually pick an Atos and you have it. You end up with needing a feature that it doesn't have. You actually have to build this, and then you look at Linux, you already have the feature. Best example of these ones are when you have like IP support. You need an IPv6 stack um, that you need support XYZ feature. Your Atos doesn't have it. Linux already has it. Where do you spend your time? Shrinking Linux or building that feature into your Atos? Same goes for something like Wi-Fi connectivity. Linux already has it. On your Atos, you might actually have to build it, or maybe it doesn't work as well as you think because only few users actually use it there, because otherwise they're focused on other radio technologies like 15.4 and so on. So as I said, there's a rumbling zone. I think it's going to shift a while. Um, earlier, I would have thought the Atos will shift further away and will grow up into the uh, larger space when it goes over 8 megabyte, but I think Linux has made a couple of strides to get towards a smaller space, so we will see where this goes in the next couple of years. Um, while my scale was a little bit drawn down from what I've seen and experienced, there's also the fun one that uh, Tim Bird put down in October last year. Um, I called it his serial scale, um, and it pretty goes in the direction that there's a steady decline for the price of silicon. The silicon will get cheaper and cheaper, and he went out and actually spent a lot of time looking at it, and he found that the cheapest Android phone is $29. That's about a year ago now. Uh, and the uh, cheapest uh, uh, computer was pretty much $9. That could run Linux. Um, I think the prices will have gone down, maybe not as crazy as significantly, but we're already pretty cheap. And I was at a conference uh, last week where the speaker gift was a Raspberry Pi, so they basically hand you some of these computers uh, if you don't run fast enough away from them. Um, so the estimation from him was that the cheapest Linux-capable SoC with an MMU, which is the important part, otherwise you have to jump to a lot of hoops that might not well pay off, is about $3, and that was a year ago. Um, but the basic assumption is that if you want to get a computer in a serial box, uh, like the toy thing, um, you need it for less than a dollar with SoC display battery and input. So it needs to do something useful. It probably has to display something, otherwise they throw it away right away. You need to fit the battery in there as well. So that's the price where this has come down. And once we're actually there, then Linux has reached the stage where it became part of like a throwaway toy kind of uh, uh, computer systems. Um, and I was looking how we can get there. Well, the price of the silicon we have to wait out, but actually the further we shrink Linux, the uh, uh, easier it will be to not actually pick an Atos and pick Linux. As I said, this is an, a year ago. Um, I haven't gone around looking up the uh, new numbers for this year, and I don't remember Tim has been doing it one. But if I ever run into him again, I will ponder him about this, do this again. It's an interesting talk. You can find it online. Uh, the slides are available. It's really interesting what he has done there. So I know that a small, I can't fit a Linux into the rambling zone that I mentioned earlier by just uh, taking a kernel building it and putting on the hardware. So I, in the end, sat down, okay, so what do I actually want from this device? Because I wanted to pick a clear focus in where uh, we can actually make a difference. So for me, if I imagine a small device, an IoT device, the first thing it has to do, it has to measure and access sensor data. So a thermometer uh, or any kind of devices that measure any kind of things that you want to do, or heart rates or something like that. Um, to make it useful in the IoT space, it most likely has to get its data that it sends out to somewhere else. So we need wireless connectivity what sorts ever, but we need some sort of way to get the data back out of the device. And we need to have it battery powered with properly long lifetime so we make sure that uh, we have that supported and it can run for a long time. Mainly with these IoT devices, my example is some people want to take this, build this, ditch it in the ocean for the next three years and then pick it back out. You can't go and uh, dive down and replace the battery. So these kind of things you have to consider. Um, and every time um, I have these devices in front of me, I will end up with most of the times with three categorizations. Uh, one is the really dead simple sensor, and that's the Bluetooth heart rate monitor, thermometer. Pick your favorite bed of Bluetooth device that does nothing else except measure, and you can access the data over Bluetooth low energy. Really simple, tons of out there, really dirt cheap, and you will find everything from find me tags to anything else. Uh, the second category gets a little bit trickier, and there's really where the interesting stuff goes on, where you actually have IPv6 support, 
uh, in your device, and that's generally an IP-enabled node, and then you play with Bluetooth Low Energy or uh, 15.4 or Thread as a technology going on to actually build your networks. And that's also where mesh technologies uh, come into play. A lot of these ones are also used with home automation in uh, some countries where they actually run IP6 networks for your home automation. And then you have the bigger ones uh, where you have the gateways um, like a desktop box or uh, your router or Wi-Fi access point, anything else. Um, and we've seen that some of the companies besides Wi-Fi are now put uh, threat, so 15.4 radios and Bluetooth Low Energy in there because they see the market is growing where these ones become the fundamental home automation hubs for you where you um, will bridge your phone into it where, or your other network. And there's a couple of companies uh, having these ones used as uh, uh, home automation hubs. So the gateway side, I don't think this is a problem. We have been running Linux on access points for the longest time. Adding a couple of more radios and supporting them is pretty easy, and a lot of companies have done this. I've seen even NAS boxes for your home uh, storage systems where you plug a Bluetooth dongle in that all of a sudden it supports Bluetooth, and they haven't really figured out what to do with it, but it's so easy to do, they just do it. Um, the IP nodes become a little trickier, and I will have a slide on this one later. Um, where unless you're as large as a gateway, that's a little trickier. And a Bluetooth sensor um, is currently really not the space of Linux. It's doable if you have enough RAM, but uh, I will go through this uh, exercise, know what it takes to actually bring this down a little bit so we could actually build a Bluetooth sensor running Linux and what sizes we get out of this one. Um, with the size I had in mind, there was obviously no way we're going to just take a Debian, Fedora, whatever distributions, boot it and hope for the best. Um, that's way too big, and you don't really get there. So I ended up with picking a couple of ingredients, and I just put the logo here. Most of you have ideas what projects are behind this. Any idea? It normally doesn't really get that far. So on, on the right is the Muzzle C library. So we needed a C library for obvious reasons. Um, I chose Muzzle because it's most standard compliant. We've done a lot of fixes for upstream projects, so they compile with Muzzle and follow the standard really strictly. And it also shrinks it re itself really, really small. There's more optimizations possible, but by default, it gets really, really tiny. Um, and I, I looked at all the other ones. They work as well, but Muzzle seemed to be the most reliant one. Obviously, we wanted to use Linux, so we're going to use Linux kernel. And while Gummy Boot, strictly speaking, doesn't exist anymore, it existed when I did this project uh, um, about a year ago. Uh, it's now consumed into systemd boot, or whatever that is called now, but the concepts are pretty much the same. Um, the two lower ones are L, it's our own embedded Linux library, which basically packages together th things like main loops, hashes, some crypto functionality, etc., where you would normally then take something larger like glib or some other bigger libraries. It's nicely compartmentalized and optimized for small systems. Um, and we have been putting, we've been releasing this for about two years now, and we finally started uh, making some use out of it. So. And then I wanted to use a Bluetooth sensor, so I picked Bluesy and uh, it's like, look, what are we going to need to do to make that one small and integrated? So with this all in mind, I wanted to take this and uh, put this together uh, and see how to build this differently. And now it becomes the fun part. I actually decided to reimagine Linux completely differently. Um, I hope this is recognizable. Um, so. I didn't focus on actually getting a bootloader in. My bootloader was, okay, we're going to start with a UEFI-based system and go from there. Uh, and with a UEFI-based system, the fun thing is you can actually boot Linux out of it without actually installing something like Grab or any of their bootloader. That's where Gummy Boot comes into play because it provides you an EFI stub that you can then use to actually bootstrap the Linux kernel. Um, so fundamentally, you're building a PE, so Windows executable, uh, and booting this one. So you need the EFI stub that comes from Gummy Boot, and then you link in uh, a couple of operating system information that's purely informational, uh, but you also link in your uh, kernel command line, you link your BZ image into uh, that binary, and then you link an in-memorfs into your binary as well, and then you link this correctly together, and then it becomes a PE executable that you can pretty much put on any UFI capable system and just boot. So UFI will find the PE executable, uh, it will jump to the Linux kernel, the Linux kernel will boot, it will jump to the uh, inner RAM FS and then execute the inner RAM FS. At that point, still a little bit different, but still pretty much straightforward since it's still how Linux would be doing it uh, anyway. The difference is the inner RAM FS is actually not a full Linux system. It's just a single process, it's PID1 um, that is dedicatedly built to just do one thing, and in this case, for the example that I chose, uh, be a Bluetooth peripheral. So we're having Bluesy uh, playing the uh, uh, 
PID1, the init process. Nice advantage with picking UFI. First of all, it works so nicely on AI32 and x64. It will also work on ARM. It's just I work for Intel, so obvious choices were ARM ba uh, Intel based systems. Um, but it will also work on ARM if you want to build it this way. The really nice advantage is you can also sign this image and use the secure boot facility of UFI, and then you can just uh, have a secure boot all the way through without having to do any extra work on this one, because at the end of the day, this is a binary, so you only need to sign this once, and you don't have to do any extra attestation to make sure it, the right code gets executed. That's also the reason why the command line is fused into the uh, uh, image itself, so you can't mess with that one. So, to recap, what is this one? EFI step from Gummy Boot, or these days System Deboot, um, a label for your operating system, that's pretty much optional, but nice to have in case you want to put two images on these where, which you would do for upgrade path, or if you have two selections that you want, oh, I want to upgrade to this one, but it falls back to the other one, so if something goes wrong, you have some sort of identification string, which one got actually booted. Um, the command line, as I said, if you want to sign this, it's important it's in there, then the kernel itself, and then the user space. If you want to try this out, you put this on uh, inside EFI boot, uh, and then pick the right EFI magic name, it's a FAT32 partition, so you can put this on a SD card, USB stick, you choose it. You stick it in a UFI-capable system, for example, Galileo or Minobot Max, uh, and it will just boot. As I said earlier, software update is just by replacing this one with a new version. UFI already has a facility to uh, boot a different system, uh, different image if it's available, and fall back to a previous one, so even you have the fallback cases nicely covered. Big advantage to secure boot, you don't have to do anything, you just have to sign your binary and UFI will take care of the rest of you. So, PID1, a um, little bit of background on the PID1. So to actually get this down in, in size, uh, I had to redo PID1. So I couldn't just say, okay, I'm gonna take systemd, I mean, that's already two or three megabyte out of the question, then I need a normal standard C library, that's all not gonna work. So if you wanna take the smaller and you know what you're actually after, then you can do this really simply by just using your right C library, your right helper library, and then the task you want to do, have a project that actually emulates PID1. And PID1 has to do a couple of extra tasks. So the kernel does a few things for you with dev tempfs and some other file system that you can have it mount automatically or mount manually. You don't have to do any extra work there. Um, but there's a couple of few device links that you need to create in the user space. So we had to do this in BlueZ now, when it is a PID1. You have to mount a couple of virtual file system, a few tempfs, a dev tempfs, etc., uh, to get this booted up, otherwise it's just gonna fail because it misses the things. Um, you have to set up the hardware. Um, normally, Bluetooth, Bluesy would only set up the Bluetooth hardware, but now you have to do also some other, few minor hardware setups. Um, we wanted to have a watchdog, since there's nothing else providing a watchdog. Um, you have to do that as well, otherwise you can't really reboot your system in case something really goes wrong. And then you need to start the Bluetooth operation. The interesting part is really that we actually don't have a file system. So we don't have anything else. So it stays as dev root. And dev root is just a tempfs that the kernel has your inner ROMFS in there mapped directly. That means we can't actually store any persistent data. And here's where another trick from EFI comes in that you can use EFI variables to actually have persistent storage. And in this case, this is fine because what we need to store for these cases are we need to store a couple of states. Uh, your Bluetooth address or some persistent state that you might have fused in. There can be only read-only. Um, but it is enough to actually get you going in a way that it works out nicely. Um, so pretty much you boot on a FAT32 file system, you keep uh, dev root as tempfs, and then you just get going, create your extra links, mount your file system, and then off you go, be a Linux system, uh, while you all run in PID1 uh, with your main operations. So, from the idea to actually getting this done. I actually did this uh, initially in QAMO, um, mainly because I was lazy and didn't want to tinker with hardware too much uh, until I figured out that this is actually possible. So it boots in QAMO. The Bluetooth controller that we needed is forwarded to a serial port. So BlueZ and QAMO have the nice capabilities that you can take a USB dongle, take it in your desktop and say, look, please forward this one as a serial uh, device into my QAMO session, and then you have your controller there. Um, so it turns a USB dongle into a UART controller and you can then just work with it. Works pretty nicely. So in QEMO, this ended up um, in this configuration that I just showed was less than a megabyte of size if I build a 64-bit binary. And I, in the end, went lazy. I built the 64-bit binary since I run a 64-bit Fedora OS. So it's like, okay, I don't want to cross-compile this. I'm just going to see how far I'm going to get and I deal with using 32-bit uh, later on if I have to. But I already got pretty lucky with this one and said, look, this is already kind of small, so it can only get smaller from there by choosing 32-bit. 
Um, but I actually wanted to try this on real hardware, so I took a micro SD card in my, one of my Mino boards. Um, now you need a little bit more since the hardware is not really designed for being small. But even with taking USB and PCI support in there to get uh, the USB controllers working, uh, and then take a physical USB dongle to t uh, put it on there and actually use it, it ended up in 1.3 megabyte of size for a 64-bit uh, uh, binary. I was going to build the 32-bit, but at that point, the flashing of the 32-bit BIOS into the Minobot Max was a little bit of more trouble that I had time for. Um, that's up to some of you who might want to try this. So at that point, we had a simple peripheral that can read the sensor data out and provide it over Bluetooth LE, and the whole stack was available, um, uh, and we can use it. As I said, 32-bit would have gotten us even smaller. Um, while this one all worked, it was kind of nice and was kind of uh, good to see that we actually can get really small if we find a dedicated use case. The question is how we can go even further, because this was not uh, trying to actually change anything in the Linux kernel. This was pretty much taking it, building it, choosing the right ingredients, putting them rightly together, uh, and then see uh, where we get. So what I got at is, look, if we want to go this small, we need a dedicated PID1. And for that one, we had to redo Bluezy in a way that we actually had to take things out. So Bluetooth Classic support uh, is pretty large, uh, especially in Linux, since it's complicated and we support so many configurations. Uh, for the main case, because the, the desktop site had to be all mighty and magic and had to deal with a lot of uh, crazy corner cases. Um, so we took that one out and focused on low energy with this former protocol a lot simpler. But we never actually planned for supporting such a configuration. So Bluezy was not really ready for doing this one, so we had to actually build uh, switches and uh, uh, configuration options to actually allow us to take the classic support out. Same as if you run SPID1, you don't need any extra IPC. You're the only process in the system. You don't talk to anybody else except the kernel. So we also had to take most of the IPC out uh, and make sure that we actually don't uh, uh, include any extra um, uh, code sizes because of that, and mainly is taking Dbus support out. Um, Using L and Muscle were designed for this purpose, so they came in really in handy when you compile a static PID1. The next one was fundamentally, okay, we have to start off with a kernel that is already small. So uh, you need the tiny config kernel, and you pretty much can just uh, start with make tiny config. It gets you already really small, and then you select what you extra want, or you even deselect some things that these are providing. Um, a little bit later on, we finally got the support for execute in place. If you want to re build a real piece of hardware using uh, this kind of system, you really, need, you really want execute in place uh, and not uh, uh, need the extra RAM that Linux needs to unpack the init RAMFS. Um, that's something you really don't want to incur, so you want execute in place. Uh, possible uh, patches are there, I linked in the LWN article. Another interesting piece for size optimization is the LTO support. Um, and when you can do link time binary writing and uh, cold code compression. Um, excellent presentation from Tim Burt as well. He did a lot of work in this area. So um, if you haven't read this, I haven't seen this one, I really recommend reading this one if you're into this stuff. He did a really good job in explaining some of these things. Um, the kernel is now the, well, the user space was in the end pretty easy to shrink down. Um, the kernel side gets a little bit more trickier. As I said, the user space don't need any IPC, so the kernel doesn't need any IPC either, you can take this out. Um, since we only run a single process, we don't need any user IDs or group IDs. We will be running as root and root only, and that's about it. Um, we're running one process, so all the complicated pieces of fork and exec are completely not needed either, since it's one process, nothing else. All the system calls that Linux provides, there are a couple of config options to disable system calls, but there's so many more that are the default on that we wouldn't actually need, so there's a lot of things you can actually take out additionally. Um, the whole command line passing is a lot of extra code that Linux carries around that in this case you would actually not need since you know exactly what you're doing. Um, even the virtual file system is pretty limited since we only have tempfs and uh, um, uh, the, we don't even have the FAT32. We have pretty much only have tempfs and uh, some other virtual file systems for some uh, control. We wouldn't, strictly speaking, need a big fancy scheduler since we are a simple process, so the only thing that needs to be scheduled is PID1 and the few kernel threads that Linux starts. Um, if, you're on, if you focus on Bluetooth, the networking sites needs not much there as well. You need some basic networking support, um, which when you do this, you only select Bluetooth and no other networking, it's kind of a funky situation. Why it compiles parts of the netfilter code anyway and links it in. So there's a couple of extra things. 
And as I mentioned earlier with the user space, um, we did not need Bluetooth Classic or high-speed support, so there was a lot of code chunks that we actually could eliminate as well. And there are plenty of more where you can, when you start looking, uh, these things we can actually take away. I just picked the big ones that were obvious and standing out and would have made a huge uh, difference. Uh, but there are quite a few more where you can actually just find and fine-tune it. Um, single user support went into 4.1, so there's a little bit of progress. Uh, we put in the Bluetooth LE only options, so that's as well. We have patches for the security manager to take it out, mainly because in some cases you would actually not build the security manager because you rely on uh, higher level security and then you just can say, okay, we just don't need it. We don't need to build, uh, put ECDH uh, or um, uh, AES into the kernel because we're actually not using it at that point in time. Um, However, the biggest problem is actually getting these things uh, upstream since some parts of the kernel community don't really like when you talk about size optimization or you want to make it smaller. They want to reduce the number of configuration options. It's like, look, either you allow us to go smaller uh, or we're going to become uh, uh, irrelevant in the cases of the small devices, uh, as Jonathan Corbett mentioned earlier. So there needs to be balance. Some patches get accepted, other ones have a really hard time uh, to making the case for it. The areas we focused on initially was pretty much one of the fun ones. If you try to run Linux as IPv6 only, that's still not possible. Um, and the reason is not because nobody wants to. A lot of companies, not even in IoT space, where pretty much the only thing you do is IPv6, but also in the data center world where they actually don't need an IPv4 network anymore because they've completely migrated. Um, but the code is so entangled between IPv4 and IPv6 that it will really probably take a while to actually get this untangled and finally uh, only boot with an IPv6-only system where IPv4 is uh, no longer supported. Another fun one is that the IoT space actually doesn't need TCP, or some of them do, but if they are smart and power, uh, care about their power efficiency and their battery lifetimes, they will actually start using UDP because they don't want to have the huge uh, state and window tracking of TCP. But actually building something with uh, config TCP no, which you would think is a kernel option, but it isn't, is actually complicated. We have patches for this one that actually turns TCP into a no-op, so all packets will uh, pretty much be rejected. And that was one of David Miller's concerns that he doesn't want to enable user space TCP stacks. He pretty much wants, look, uh, fine if you want to disable the code and not build in, but then please behave uh, that nobody can use this to create uh, a user space TCP stack. And we have patches for this one that needs to get uh, pushed upstream at some point. Um, there's another area where once you enable config net, which you need for NFC, 15.4, Bluetooth, it builds a lot of extra things, as I mentioned earlier. So sometimes you actually, oh, some code of the net filter uh, is compiled and then linked in, which actually shouldn't be. So there's a lot of cleanup when you build a tiny config where one option drags and some other code bases that it probably shouldn't. Um, we haven't even touched that one yet to see what we can do there. The more interesting part is when we look at uh, things like IP nodes uh, where you actually rely on DTLS, so TLS over UDP sockets, that you actually have to get in a, a TCP, uh, sorry, a, a TLS stack to actually have your proper security. Um, if you played with OpenTL, OpenSSL or GNU TLS, then you realize that it's actually a pretty big library and have a pretty high, heavy uh, uh, runtime uh, overhead. Not to mention it's complicated and uh, sometimes they have also security flaws and has been forked three or four times by now into different project names that I don't even remember. So picking the right TLS library is complicated. Some of them actually don't work as you would think. Some of them have blocking operations in areas where you actually can't block because you have to do something else. So there's a couple of issues with this one. Um, at some point we decided maybe it's actually not worthwhile to consider open TLS, open SSL or GNU TLS at all. So we looked into what we actually need to get TLS into the kernel. Um, and parts of this one actually is already available. TS itself isn't, but the one important part when you do enterprise uh, devices is that you want to have um, the uh, certificate management and certificate um, uh, authorization uh, and authentication completely done. And the fun thing, Linux kernel supports most of this one, or did support most of this one out of the box, since it has to deal with secure boot and uh, the uh, chain of trust that it creates because of secure boot. So the kernel understands X509 certificates. It can verify them. 
but there was pretty much missing a functionality where you could control this from user space. So what we have been building in the last couple of months is a way to be able to actually create key rings inside the kernel that have certificates as keys in there, and they are uh, verified against each other, and then that eventually you can seal them off and say, this is my trusted CA. Um, that CA might come from a file system, might come from a TPM, might actually be just represented by keys that are actually inside some piece of hardware that you just reference as an ID. So there's been a lot of work ongoing um, to make this actually a reality, and we are really close to have this all upstream so you can actually use this. And we've put support into L in our embedded Linux library to actually drive this, so you can just create a new key, say it's a certificate, and then it will handle all the rest uh, behind it for you to make sure that gets added to the right key rings and the key rings become... Uh, uh, authenticate against each other. So what this means at the end of the day, eventually you can even say, I have one process at the, at the init phase that loads my CA into the, into the keyring system, and then it can become available in every single process because the keyrings can be referenced into threads uh, and uh, into process into threads uh, individually, and then you can actually use them to reference your uh, uh, CA. So you don't, every process at startup don't need to actually load the CAs again. It's still an early stage. There's a kernel tree on kernel.org that combines all the work of the different crypto subsystems, the keyring subsystem, and some other subsystems to actually make sure that this can be tested. Um, I should have put the link in the slides, um, but I think you will easily find it. Um, and eventually, uh, we might actually get to having TLS and DTLS support inside the kernel. Uh, TLS is something that a lot of uh, enterprise people want. DTLS becomes really interesting when you use VPNs, etc., because then you don't have to switch through user space to actually do the uh, uh, processing of the packet, uh, encrypt it and send it back, or de-encrypt it and send it back to the kernel. So it's making slow progress, but I think it's making a little bit of progress to get towards this one. Um, we will be also using the TLS side into our new Wi-Fi daemon because when we talk about IoT uh, and you talk about Wi-Fi and IoT, you will talk about enterprise security. You will not talk about pre-shared keys that you use in your home. A lot of devices that have to uh, be deployed then have to use enterprise security, and that becomes even more important. And we really don't want to deal with uh, GNU TLS and OpenSSL in these libraries. We want to use the kernel crypto functionality as much as possible, and there's been a lot of work to be able to use that from user space. As I said before, uh, IWD, we open sourcing this one at I Open IoT Summit next week. Um, and I will also be giving a talk about this one there and then showcase it. So, so much for this one. The big elephant when I gave this presentation end of last year for the first time um, was that UUFI is required. And everybody who knows a little bit of UUFI, that's actually pretty big. It doesn't have to be, because UUFI, the reference implementation of UUFI has everything and the kitchen sink in it, including Wi-Fi and Bluetooth support itself for whatever reason. Um, but at the end of the day, UFI is just a spec. So it's just a standard and an interface description on how you interface, how you build your bootloader or your, your system uh, entity, and then you can, the operating system can use it. So when I did this presentation first time last year, it was pretty much, okay, this is something we need to look into, how much you can shrink it, how much the extra overhead adds it to it. The funny thing is actually that literally a week later after I gave this presentation for the first time, uh, Alexander Graf said, okay, uh, I actually ported EFI support for U-Boot, and so you can use this on systems that don't natively support UFI. So you can play with this one and get a few things uh, working there as well, and some of these concepts then apply as well. So that was kind of a nice surprise, nice Christmas gift uh, uh, for that one. Uh, while this was a big elephant, it's now, it's still a big elephant, but it's a smaller big elephant, and people can play with this one even on systems that currently don't have native UFI support, but they have U-Boot support. Um, so, some of my closing notes. Um, the interesting part with actually doing this with Linux is testing and verification of these things become really simple. So I didn't even try to do this on real hardware for at least a month because I could just run this in QEMO or I even could run PID1 straight as with a special switch in it. Say, look, you're behaving like a normal process, so please skip the setup of the system. Um, and I could just test most out of it uh, all the way through. You can use namespaces in Linux support to do, uh, simplify your testing, but your turnaround time for actually getting some of your code developed is way quicker because you take a Fedora installation, Ubuntu, Debian, pick your choice, and then you just get going because all the functionality is already there and you can use a lot of these things. And you don't have to, oh, I need to compile this, I need to cross-compile this, put this on. Huge turnaround time, which saved me a lot of time when I had to do some of these uh, crazy testing. 
interesting enough, uh, once it comes to wireless hardware, they also some of these ones are really easy to emulate um, with Kiemo and then have it tested, and then you only do the field testing once you actually have confidence in your code. So it saves a lot of time instead of just having to deal with hardware issues. You focus on the ones that work nicely. And with Linux and the Linux subsystem for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 15.4, etc., and all the abstractions that it has, you can retest really with any hardware or virtual devices and then pick the real hardware, and you don't really have to do any extra integration work because Linux has already done this for you. Literally, KVM and KMO is your friend if you have to do any kind of these things. Without this, uh, a lot of this would be uh, painful and horrible to test. Um, since you can also emulate it, it gives a huge opportunity for a continuous integration when you actually need to actually make sure, okay, I've built this now, I want to make sure that I don't break it, so you can easily integrate this in, uh, in a CI system, or even with hardware labs, where you basically put a new UF binary on it, boot, or that works, put a new one on it, boot, and you don't have to do the massive installations. Um, pretty nice and easy to do. Um, I think the interesting part, however, is Linux developers are still easier to come by than dedicated Atos developers. So think twice before you jump to an Atos project uh, and have someone say, oh yeah, I'm just going to use the Atos, it's easy, I have two guys in my company that know this stuff, and then these two guys left, and then how are you going to replace them? A Linux developer is a lot easier, and we have a lot more of them these days as the dedicated Atos developer for XYZ Atos. So, uh, that helps you maybe in the decision finding when you actually want to build something that is sustainable. Um, some of my colleagues actually took this idea a little bit further and integrated it into Soleda, um, which you, they can use to build many kind of variations on systems for your target system, but it also can use this idea to actually uh, build your UFI binary and then put it straight on the system. So. In the end, it's just a config option what your output will be. Will it be a full Debian system with systemd, or will it be a UFI binary uh, with this dedicated bluesy peripheral code in there or something else? So um, if you don't want to build this all nitty-gritty by yourself, you can look into Solera to actually trying to get something bootstrapped and see how this is going to work and plays out. Stick it on a Mino board, stick it on a Galileo board, and have a, and toy with it. And uh, since of recent Edison, Edison supports uh, UFI boot as well, and a recent kernel, so even the Intel Edison is a nice playground for this one, or any ARM board if you choose to have one. Um, with that one, thank you very much, and uh, questions, please. Oh, sorry, I, I can't really see much, so... Um, I think they have microphones, so if you might come into the front. Otherwise, I'm going to repeat the question. Hello. Hey. Actually, you said that uh, you removed IPv4 and instead you put IPv6. So what if, uh, as I, my limited knowledge uh, tell me, it's... Uh, uh, we cannot uh, using NAT, uh, IPv6 to IPv4 NAT. Yeah, uh, is it possible for using somewhere that there is no IPv6 available nowadays? So we haven't succeeded in removing IPv4. That's a work in progress. Um, the reason why removing IPv4 is interesting because the sensor networks only run IPv6 only. So 6 low pan and some other stuff, when you run 15.4 or Bluetooth on a sensor network, they will only speak IPv6. You will never see an IPv4 packet. The translation is done on the gateway side. Um, obviously, if you have a mixed network where you have to run some legacy IPv4, you can't really do this. It's only for that cases where the technology has no provisioning for IPv4 in the first place. And that's 15.4 and Bluetooth. Because uh, actually, we can pad. I mean, using IP, uh, natting IPv4, IPv4 to IPv6, but we cannot uh, nat IPv6 to IPv4. Yes, yes, that's that correct. Impossible. But it would be purely IPv6 network. You will never see an IPv4 packet. That's what the it's, it case for this. It takes time, actually, to migrate to IPv6. Say again, please. Doesn't it takes time to migrate to IPv6 completely? Oh yeah, it takes time. The sensor networks only run IPv6, so they, they have no migration. They started with a clean slate. The enterprise side migrated. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If I don't see any, if you have questions, please speak up because I can't see everybody in the room. And uh, thank you very much and have a good day.